So good afternoon and welcome to the House Government and Energy Committee this afternoon. We are taking up H687, an act relating to community resilience and biodiversity protection through land use. And before we turn it over to our legislative council, um, Seth and I are probably gonna say just a couple words. It's a bill that we have co-sponsored um, and worked on in the off session together. And I'll kick it off and just say that uh, title of the bill is building on our conservation work from last year. And I'm calling this uh, Community Resilience and Biodiversity Protection Act II. And the communities are both human and natural communities as similar to the conservation work that we did, but this is like a complement to it through the um, supporting uh, of land use policies that um, allow us to maintain an intact functional landscape um, and also protect our human communities with that landscape and help promote um, dense development in our downtown and, and um, village centers. So with that, we're, we built on our past work. And for those of you who've been around the block, you know that we've been working on this since about 2017, when we had the Act 250 Commission. And um, Seth and I actually had a bill on the wall last year around governance that we worked on in this committee. You all will be familiar with that. We took that as our starting point for the bill this year. Uh, in addition, <clears throat> we stayed in touch with processes happening throughout the off session, including the ones we heard about last week, the Natural Resources Board um, study, the future land use map work that our Regional planning commission brought to us last week, the delegation study as well, and the designation study, which we will hear about later on this week. So that's kind of, you'll see it's not lined up perfectly because a lot of that work was still in process as we were working through our bill. And um, we'll, as we work through the bill as a committee, we'll look to see what pieces make sense to plug into this bill as we discuss land use this session. And with that, I'll turn it over to Representative Bongar. I actually think that is a perfectly <laughs> adequate uh, okay. summary and um, off we go. All right, off yeah. we go. All right, welcome, <clears throat> Legislative Council Tchaikovsky. Thank you, Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Council. I'm here on H687. So as Representative Sheldon did mention just now, um, the first 36 pages of this bill should look very familiar to you because it is almost the same language that was passed in S234 in 2022, and that language got vetoed by the governor. And what that language, prim primarily what that language does is uh, reform the Natural Resources Board into the en Environmental Review Board and give them the authority to hear appeals of Act 250 permits, as well as a number of other things that are new to this bill. So we st I'll start there. Um, most of that language, probably 80 to 90% of it is the same as that prior bill, um, but a few small changes have been made. I'll point that out. And then the rest of the bill are newer concepts, although, as you mentioned, a lot of them were in the Act 250 Commission Report from 2018. So multiple of those pieces you have heard about before. And then there's the really new stuff that came out of some of the um, reports from this summer. Um, so as I'm walking, I'm going to walk through, um, first on page one, the, the purpose section, because there have been some changes made, uh, to this language to reflect the new additions to this bill. Um, but as I'm going through, you may not need a, an exact walkthrough of every section because you've seen this language actually multiple times, but you can let me know. So on page one, section one is the purpose section. So the purpose of this act is to further assist the state in achieving the conservation vision and goals for the state established in 10 VSA 2802. And that's the 30 by 30 and 50 by 50 goals that you worked on uh, last session. 
It provides a regulatory framework that supports the vision for Vermont of human and natural community resilience and biodiversity protection in the face of climate change, as described in 2023 Acts and Resolve number 59, which again is the 30 by 30, 50 by 50 bill. It would strengthen the administration of the Act 250 program by changing the structure, function, and name of the Natural Resources Board. Onto page two. It requires that appeals of the Act 250 permit decisions that it requires that appeals of Act 250 permit decisions be heard by a five member board called the Environmental Review Board. The Environmental Division of the Superior Court would continue to hear the other types of cases within its jurisdiction. The Environmental Review Board would retain the current duties of the Natural Resources Board in addition to hearing appeals, reviewing applications for the planned growth area designation, review the future land use maps of regional plans, and review the maps that establish the rural and working lands areas. The board would provide oversight, management, and training to the Act 250 program staff and district commissions and develop Act 250 program policy through permit decisions and rulemaking. This change would allow the Act 250 program to be a more citizen-friendly process. The structure established under this act would be used to guide state financial investments in infrastructure. Section two then adds a purpose statement that will actually be added to the statute, the Act 250 statute itself. That prior one I just read would be a session law provision. So uh, Act uh, 10 VSA 6000 is added to read purpose construction. The purposes of this chapter are to protect and conserve the environment of the state, to support the achievement of the goals of the capability and Deve development plan of 24 VSA section 4302C, and of the conservation vision and goals for the state established in 2802 of this title. So 4302C are the goals established for the municipal zoning, uh, the, the planning and zoning chapter, which includes regional planning and municipal planning. And then again, 2802 is the, tw the 30 by 30 and 50 by 50 goals. On to page three. Uh, this starts the statutory changes to the Natural Resources Board. So section three is amending 6021 <clears throat> board established. The Environmental Review Board is created to administer the Act 250 program in your appeals. The board shall consist of five members appointed by the governor after review and approval by the Environmental Review Board nominating committee in accordance with subdivision two of this subsection and confirmed with the advice and consent of the Senate so that one may appoint so that one appointment expires in each year. Um, and so you will recall from the prior bill that um, the nominating committee is established um, in the next section. So I'll talk about that more in detail in the next couple of pages. <clears throat> but back to line nine, the chair shall be a full-time position and the other four members shall be half-time positions. <clears throat> in making these appointments, the governor and the Senate shall give consideration to candidates who have experience, expertise, or skills relating to one or more of the following areas, environmental science, natural resources, law and policy, land use planning, community planning, or environmental justice. The governor shall appoint a chair of the board, a position that shall be a full-time position, the governor shall ensure board membership reflects to the extent possible, the racial, ethnic, gender, and geographic diversity of the state. The board shall not contain two members who reside in the same county. Following initial appointments, the members shall be appointed for terms of five years. All terms shall begin on July 1, onto page four and expire on June 30th. A member may continue serving until a successor is appointed. The initial appointment shall be for staggered terms of one year, two year, three years, four years, and five years. 
The Environmental Review Board Nominating Committee shall advertise the position when a vacancy will occur on the Environmental Review Board. The Nominating Committee shall review the applicants to determine which are well qualified for appointment to the board and shall recommend those candidates to the governor. The names shall be confidential. The governor shall appoint, with the advice and consent of the Senate, a chair and four members of the board from the list of well-qualified candidates sent to the governor by the committee. On to page five. Terms, vacancy, succession. The term of each appointment subsequent to the initial appointments described in subsection A of this section shall be five years. Any appointment to fill a vacancy shall be for the unexpired portion of the, the term vacant, vacated. A member may seek reappointment by informing the governor. If the governor decides not to reappoint the member, the nominating committee shall advertise the vacancy. Removal. Notwithstanding the provisions of 3 VSA section 2004, members shall only be removable for cause by the remaining members of the board in accordance with the Vermont Administrative Procedures Act. The board shall adopt rules pursuant to 3 VSA chapter 25, the Administrative Procedures Act, to define the basis and process for removal. Uh, disqualified members, the chair of the board upon request of the chair of a district commission may appoint and assign former commission members to sit on specific commission cases when some or all of the regular members or alternates of the district commission are disqualified or unable to serve. Retirement from office. When a board member who hears all or a substantial part of a case retires from office before the case is completed, the member may retain, may remain a member of the board onto page six at the member's discretion for the purpose of concluding and deciding that case and signing the findings and judgments involved. A retiring chair may also remain a member for the purpose of certifying questions of law if a party appeals to the Supreme Court. For the service, the member shall receive reasonable compensation to be fixed by the remaining members of the board and necessary expenses while on official business. So I believe all of the language in that section is the same as the prior version that you passed. <clears throat> section four on page six is establishing the Environmental Re Review Board Nominating Committee. And this is very similar to the language you previously passed, but it has, um, I think, one primary change, uh, which is that instead of seven members, the committee will have six. So on line 11, Creation. The Environmental Review Board Nominating Committee is created for the purpose of assessing the qualifications of applicants for appointment to the Environmental Review Board in accordance with Section 621, 6021 of this title, which is the prior section I just read you. Members, the committee shall consist of six members who shall be appointed as follows. The governor shall appoint two members from the executive branch which with at least one being an employee of the Department of Human Resources. Two, the Speaker of the House of Representatives shall appoint two members from the House of Representatives. On to page seven, the Senate Committee on Committee shall appoint two members from the Senate. Terms, the members of the committee shall serve for terms of two years. Members shall serve until their successors are appointed. Members shall not serve more than three consecutive terms. A legislative, a legislative member who is appointed as a member of the committee shall retain the position for the, for the term appointed to the committee, even if the member is subsequently not reelected to the General Assembly during the member's term on the committee. Chair, the member shall elect their own chair. Quorum, the quorum of the committee shall consist of four members. Staff and services. The committee is authorized to use the staff and services of appropriate state agencies and departments as necessary to conduct investigations of applicants. Confidentiality. Except as provided in subsection H of this section, proceedings of the committee, including the names of candidates considered by the committee and information about any candidate submitted to the governor shall be confidential. The provision of one VSA section uh, 317E, expiration of Public Records Act exemption, 
shall not apply to the exemption or confidentiality provisions of the subsection. Public information, the following shall be public up to page eight. Operating procedures of the committee, standard application forms and any other forms used by the committee, provided they not, do not contain personal information about a candidate or confidential proceedings. All proceedings of the committee prior to receipt of the first candidate's completed application. At the, and at the time of the, the committee sends the name of the candidates to the governor, the total number of applicants for the vacancies and the total number of candidates sent to the governor. Legislative uh, reimbursement, legislative members of the committee shall be entitled to per diem compensation and reimbursement for expenses in accordance with three, uh, two VSA section 23. Compensation and reimbursement shall be paid from the legislative appropriation. Duties. When a vacancy occurs, the committee shall review applicants to determine which are qualified for the board and submit those names to the governor. The committee shall review, uh, the committee shall submit to the governor a summary of the qualifications and expertise uh, and experience of each candidate whose name is submitted to the governor, together with any information relevant to the matter. An applicant for the position of member of the Environmental Review Board, an applicant for the position of member for the Environmental Review Board shall not be required to be an attorney. If the candidate is admitted, uh, page nine, to practice law in Vermont or practices a profession requiring licensure, certification or other professional regulation by the state, the committee shall submit the candidate's name to the court administrator or applicable state professional regulatory entity, and that entity shall disclose to the committee any professional disciplinary action taken or pending concerning the candidate. Candidates shall be sought who have experience, expertise, or skill relating to one or more of the following areas environmental science, natural resources law and policy, land use planning, community planning, or environmental justice. The, community, the committee shall ensure a candidate possesses the following attributes. Integrity, a candidate shall possess a record and reputation for excellent character and integrity. Impartiality, a candidate shall exhibit an ability to make judicial determinations in a manner free of bias. Work ethic, the candidate shall de demonstrate diligence, availability. The candidate shall have adequate time to dedicate to the position. Page 10. Oh, and that's, so that's the end of section four. Um, and so I'll just also say that um, section four is based on a couple of other existing statutes. Uh, it is modeled after the Cannabis Control Board nominating committee. And so the language is very similar to that statute. And then that last part I read you is actually um, based on the language that's currently in the, the judicial nominating board statute related to what they're supposed to look for for a judge. <clears throat> so on page 10 starts uh, is section five, which amends the rule section of Act 250. So the board may adopt rules of procedure for itself and the district commissions. The board shall adopt rules of procedure that govern appeals and other contested cases before it that are consistent with this chapter. The board's rules of procedure for approving regional plans and regional plan maps shall ensure that the maps are consistent with legislative intent. Um, and so that's uh, one of the first indications that the board will be reviewing uh, regional plan and regional plan maps, which is um, uh, I think probably the last section of this bill. So we'll get to more information about that later. Next in section six, powers. The board and district commissions shall have supervisory authority in environmental matters respecting projects within their jurisdiction and shall apply their independent judgment in determining facts and interpreting law. Each shall have the power with respect to any matter within its jurisdiction too. And then it lists the existing powers of the board and district commission. So um, taking oaths and depositions, um, allowing parties to enter land for purposes of inspecting, um, entering land for purpose of inspections, applying for and receiving grants. Um, and so then on to page 11. The next changes in these sections are uh, grammatical. 
So not changing any of the other existing powers of the board. And then jumping down to line 20, uh, subsection F, the board shall publish its decisions online. The board may publish online or contract to publish annotations and indices of its decisions. On to page 12, the decisions of the environmental division of the Superior Court and the Supreme Court and the texts of those deci decisions. Um, and so just so you know, uh, so currently the board doesn't make decisions. So you are including the requirement that they publish their decisions online. And then updating the existing requirement or there's a permissive ability right now for the board to publish indices of decisions on Act 250 cases. And they do do that already. They're called the e-notes. So they are online currently, but this is updating that language um, to specifically include the board's decisions as well as the Superior Court and the Supreme Court decisions. So on page 12, uh, next in subsection G, the board shall manage the process by which land use permits are issued under sec section 6086 of this title, may initiate enforcement on related matters under the provisions of chapter 201 and 211 of this title, and may initiate and hear petitions for revocation of land use permits issued under this chapter. And the grounds for uh, revocation are as follows. Excuse me, so that's one other change that the new board will have currently. Um, if the Natural Resources Board would like to revoke a permit, they actually have to petition the environmental court to do that. And so now this would be giving the Environmental Review Board the ability to initiate and hear petitions to revoke Act 250 permits. <clears throat> On to page 13. Uh, line four, the board may hear appeals of fee refund requests under section 6083A of this title. The board shall hear appeals of decisions made by the district commission and district coordinators. Subsection J, the board shall review applications for a planned growth area and approve or disapprove based on whether a municipal application demonstrates compliance with the requirements of section 6032 of this title. The board shall produce guidelines for municipalities seeking to obtain the planned growth area designation. And so I'll stop there and say quickly, that is um, an element that is also gonna be discussed later. That's part of the overall location-based jurisdiction um, and is, a, is somewhat related to the NRB's report that they came up with um, as there are planned growth areas will have a, the ability to have the, ex, have a, Act 250 exemptions. Um, and then additionally, on line 17, the board shall review for compliance the future land use maps developed by the regional planning commissions pursuant to 24 VSA 4348A A2. So again, we'll hear more about that at the end. <clears throat> on to page 14. Section seven, personnel. Regular personnel, um, I think you have passed this language a couple of times, but the board may appoint legal counsel, scientists, engineers, experts, investigators, temporary employees, and administrative personnel as it finds necessary in carrying out its duties. In providing personnel to assist the district commissions and in investigating matters within its jurisdiction. And so now that you're giving them the ability to hear appeals, um, and various other things. This is giving the board um, more authority to hire different types of personnel to assist them and the district commissions. On line eight, executive director, the board shall appoint an executive director. The director shall be a full-time state employee, shall be exempt from the state classified system, and shall serve at the pleasure of the board. The director shall be responsible for Supervising and administering the operation and implementation of this chapter and the rules adopted by the board as directed by the board. Assisting the board in its duties and administering the requirements of this chapter. 
employing such staff as may be required to carry out the functions of the board <coughs> and preparing the annual budget for submission to the board. Um, so I will just say that <clears throat> I think you initially drafted this language before the current executive director was hired. Um, so currently the executive director at the Natural Resources Board, I believe is funded temporarily. And so this is adding the statutory requirement that there be an executive director. <clears throat> so you may wanna hear um, what the current duties of the current executive director are and if they line up with the language you've had here, if you wanna make any adjustments to that. <clears throat> um, onto page 15, section eight. Um, section 6084, notice of application, hearings, commencement of review. <clears throat> so this is language you have seen before. Um, upon the filing of an application with the district commission, the district commission shall send by electronic means notice of the application to the owner of the land if the applicant is not the owner, the municipality in which the land is located, the municipal and regional planning commissions for the municipality in which the land is located, the agency of natural resources, and any adjacent Vermont municipality and municipal and regional planning commission if the land is located on a municipal or regional boundary. The district commission shall send by electronic means a copy of the notice to the town clerk's office of the town or towns in which the project lies. The town clerk shall post the notice in the town office. The applicant shall also provide a list of adjoining landowners to the district commission upon good request and for good cause, the district commission may authorize the applicant to provide a partial list of adjoining landowners in, according to the, in accordance with board rules. Uh, you said that we had seen this language before, and I noted that you said the first 36 pages were passed in S-234 in 2022. Is that where we would have seen this before, or was this somewhere else? Um, I actually think this has come up in a couple other bills because there have been other times when it's been pointed out that there isn't necessarily a requirement to do this electronically. So I think that and I think the NRB has previously asked for this language, although I'm. <clears throat> Um, and then on page 16, uh, any notice for a major or minor application as required by this section shall also be published by the district commission in a local newspaper generally circulating in the area where the development or subdivision is located and on the board's website, not more than 10 days after receipt of the complete application. <clears throat> on page 16, section nine, uh, this is amending 6086F. And all it's doing here is updating the reference to the board. And then down on line 16, following the appeal of the district commission, any stay request may be filed with the board as opposed to the environmental division. On to page 17, section 10, so this is um, the section on appeals. So appeals to the board. An appeal of any act or decision of a district commission shall be to the board and shall be accompanied by a fee pres prescribed in section 6083A of this title. Participation before the board. A person shall not appeal an act or decision that was made by a district commission unless the person was granted party status by the district commission pursuant to subdivision 6085C1E of this title, participated in the proceedings before the district commission and retained party status at the end of the district commission. In addition, the person may only appeal those issues under the criteria with respect to which the person was granted party status. However, notwithstanding these limitations, a person may appeal an act or decision of the district commission if the board determines that. Onto page 18, there was a procedural de defect that prevented the person from obtaining party status or participating in the proceeding. The decision being appealed is a grant or denial of party status or some other condition exists that would result in manifest injustice 
if the person's right to appeal was disallowed. And so I will stop there and just say that all of this language is the same language that is currently in statute for appeals to the, to the Superior Court Environmental Division. So it's just transferring this language over to the board. It's not changing the standard at all. <clears throat> Line seven, <clears throat> filing the appeal. An appellant to the board under this section <clears throat> shall file with the notice of appeal a statement of the issues to be addressed in the appeal, a summary of the evidence that will be presented, and a preliminary list of witnesses who will testify on behalf of the appellant. De novo hearing. The, bo the board shall hold a de novo hearing on all findings requested by any party that files an appeal or cross appeal according to the rules of the board. The hearing shall be held in the municipality where the project subject to the appeal is located, if possible, or as close as possible. <clears throat> Notice of appeal. Notice of appeal shall be filed with the board within 30 days following the act or decision by the district commission. The board shall notify the parties who had party status before the district commission of the filing of any appeal. Pre-hearing discovery. A party may obtain discovery of expert witnesses who may provide testimony relevant to the appeal. Expert witness pre-filed testimony, on to page 19, shall be in accordance with the Vermont rules of evidence. The use of discovery for experts shall comply with the requirements of Vermont rules of, Ev of civil procedure, rules 26 to 37, which I don't remember what they are off the top of my head, but I can get you more information on those when we go more in depth. <clears throat> Interrogatories served on non-expert witnesses shall be limited to discovery of the identity of witnesses and a summary of each witness's test testimony except by order of the board for cause shown. Interrogatories served on expert witnesses shall be in accordance with the Vermont Rules of Civil Procedure. Parties may submit requests to produce and requests to enter upon land pursuant to Vermont Rules of Civil Procedure 34. Parties may not take deposition of witnesses except by order of the board for cause shown. The board may require a party to supplement as necessary any pre-hearing testimony that is provided. Prior decisions of the former environmental board, the water resources board, the waste facilities panel, and the environmental division of the superior court shall be given the same weight and consideration as prior decisions of the environmental review board. Appeals to the Supreme Court. An appeal from a decision of the board under subsection A of this section shall be to the Supreme Court by a party as set forth in subdivision in subsection 6085 C of this title. On to page 20, objections. No objections that has not been raised before the board may be considered by the Supreme Court unless the failure or neglect to urge such objection shall be excused because of extraordinary circumstances. Appeals of decision. An appeal of a decision by the board shall be allowed pursuant to 3 VSA section 815, including the unreasonableness or insufficiency of the conditions attached to a permit. An appeal from the district commission shall be allowed for any reason, except no appeal shall be allowed when the application has been granted and no hearing was requested. Precedent. Precedent from the former environmental board and the environmental review board that interpret this chapter shall be provided the same deference by the Supreme Court as precedents accorded to other executive branch agencies charged with administering their enabling act. On appeal to the Supreme Court from the Environmental Review Board, decisions of the Environmental Review Board interpreting this act shall also be accorded that deference. <laughs> Clearly erroneous. Upon appeal to the Supreme Court, the board's finding of fact shall be accepted unless clearly erroneous. Completion of case, a case shall be deemed completed when the board enters a final decision, even though that decision is appealed to the Supreme Court and remanded by that court. Page 21, court of record jurisdiction. The board shall have the powers of a court of record in the determination and adjudication of all matters within its jurisdiction. It may initiate proceedings on any matter within its jurisdiction. It may render judgments and enforce the same 
by any suitable process issuable by courts in this state. An order issued by the board on any matter within its jurisdiction shall have the effect of a judicial order. The, board shall, the board's jurisdiction shall include the issuance of declaratory rulings on the applicability of this chapter and rules or, ordered, or orders issued under this chapter pursuant to 3 VSA 808 and the issuance of decisions on appeal pursuant to section 6007 and 6089 of this title. So 6007 is the jurisdictional opinion and 89 is uh, the appeals. Madam Stebbin. So Madam Chair, and I know you said we've already seen this before and I, I remember the floor votes, um, but I wasn't in this committee and I think only four of us were. So just for place setting, like for me, when I pull up 6,089 right now, it's like six lines. So this just for place setting for me is like a massive revamp because we haven't done that. And we now have so much that we've learned about the process based off of all of the past reports and all of that. Is that fair? It's all existing statute under the environmental court right now. And because we were proposing to move appeals to this board, it comes into this section of statute. Okay. It already is there. Okay. Yes. And so the first part is move, moving it from the environmental court's jurisdiction. And then there's actually this last couple of provisions are based on the language that the PUC has because the PUC is a quasi judicial body. And so you're making the environmental review board a quasi judicial body with the authority to hear appeals and issue judicial orders. More similar to the PUC. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> um, section, so on page 21, section 11 is 10 VSA uh, 6007. Then this is where the jurisdictional opinions uh, come up. And so actually the new language is on page 22. <clears throat> Subsection D. A person who seeks review of a jurisdictional opinion issued by a district co coordinator shall bring to the board an appeal of issues addressed in that opinion. And so this language is new because currently, as we just sort of just touched on, um, appeals of jurisdictional opinions go to the environmental court. So yes, this language is new from what was in the environmental court. The appellant shall provide notice of the filing of an appeal to each person entitled to notice mm -hmm. under subdivision 6085C1A through D of this title and to each person on an approved subdivision on an approved subdivision 6085C1B <laughs> list. Failure to appeal within 30 days following the issuance of the ju jurisdictional opinion shall render the decision of the district coordinator under subsection C of this section the final determination regarding the jurisdiction, unless the underlying jurisdictional opinion was not properly served on persons listed in 6085C1A through D of this title, and on persons on a subdivision 6085C1E list approved under subdivision C of this section. So yes, yeah, so currently, we, and we haven't, talked about Act 250 yet this year too much and uh, jurisdictional opinions, but any person at any time can request a jurisdictional opinion about a particular project and a district coordinator reviews the project plans uh, against what is required under the Act 250 statute to determine if a permit is needed. Uh, that jurisdictional opinion, whether or not something falls under Act 250 jurisdiction, is appealable currently to the environmental court. And this would be bringing it under the board. On page 23, section 12, Act 250 fees. <clears throat> All persons filing an appeal, cross appeal, or petition from a district commission decision or jurisdictional determination shall pay a fee of $295 plus publication costs. Any municipality filing an application for a planned growth area designation <clears throat> shall pay a fee of $250. Any regional planning commission filing a regional plan or future land use map to be reviewed by the board shall pay a fee of $250. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> so then section 13 amends all of chapter 220, uh, which is the environmental appeals chapter for appeals to the environmental court. And so I'm not sure if you want me to go through all of this, but what it does, it goes through and it, it gets rid of all of the references to Act 250 appeals in that chapter because they're all being moved to the Environmental Review Board. Okay. And so it leaves intact the other types of appeals that the Environmental Court does will continue to hear. <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me, that primarily are decisions of the Secretary of Natural Resources, so any permit issued by the Agency of Natural Resources, and then any municipal zoning and subdivision appeals will still go to the environmental court under this language. <clears throat> and so that takes us all the way to page 34. <clears throat> So uh, again, on page 34, section 14 uh, strikes the environmental court's uh, authority to, your, to have jurisdiction over revoking Act 250 permits. As I mentioned per previously, that is with the board as well. Uh, section 15 is uh, providing for new positions at the environmental review board. It's one staff attorney and then four half-time environmental review board members. It then appropriates $384,000 to pay for these positions. <clears throat> um, I'm trying to remember the math on that, but we could review that. I think there was a fiscal note also the last time about how that, what the breakdown of costs are there. And then on page 35, section 16 is the transition provision. Um, and so the governor shall appoint the members of the new board on or before July 1, 2025. Any existing terms uh, for members of the existing natural resources board who are not appointed shall expire on that day. As of July 1, 2025, all appropriations and employees and employee positions of the natural resources board are transferred to the environmental review board. And the new board shall adopt rules of procedure for its hearings um, for appeals, but for the other duties that they're being given on or before July 1, 2026. And then so related to that, Section 17 is about the environmental division's authority over its cases. So notwithstanding the, re the repeal of its jurisdictional authority to hear appeals relative to land use permits in Section 12 of this Act, the Environmental Division of the Superior Court shall continue to have jurisdiction to complete its consideration of any appeal that is pending before as of July 1, 2026, if the act or repeal has been filed, or if the act or appeal has been filed. The Environmental Review Board shall have authority to be a party in any appeals pending under this section until July 1, 2026. So this is setting up that the new Environmental Review Board shall start hearing appeal cases as of July 1, 2026, at which point the environmental court will not have its authority over those cases any longer. <clears throat> and then page 36, uh, finally, and related to this specific topic, section 18 is a revision authority. And so this is giving the Office of Legislative Council authority to replace all references to the Natural Resources Board with Environmental Review Board, uh, because it appears in Title Three, Title 10, Title 24, Title 29, Title 30, and Title 32. And if we include it in this bill, it would add another 30 pages probably. So this is giving me the authority to finish it after the session. So, so that is the language regarding specifically the new board. Starting on page 36 is language related to new criteria for forest blocks and connecting habitats. Um, and this is language that you have reviewed in prior sessions. Um, for those of you keeping track at home, I believe this is the language from H233 as passed the house in 2017, <laughs> but has been in this committee at multiple other points since then. So on page 36, section 19, um, it's adding new definitions to Act 250 related to this topic. So 
Connecting habitat means land or water or both that links pa patches of habitat within a landscape, allowing the movement, migration, and dispersal of wildlife and plants and the functioning of ecological processes. A connecting habitat may include features, including recreational trails and improvements constructed for farming, logging, or forestry purposes. Forest block means a contiguous area of forest in any stage of succession and not currently developed for non-forest use. A forest block may include features including recreational trails, wetlands, or other natural features that do not themselves possess tree cover or improvements constructed for farming, logging, or forestry purposes. On to page 37, fragmentation. <clears throat> fragmentation means the division or conversion of a forest block or connecting habitat by the separation of a parcel into two or more par parcels. The construction, conversion, relocation, or enlargement of any building or other structure or of any mining, excavation, or landfill and any change in the use of any building or other structure or land or extension of use of land. However, fragmentation does not include the division or conversion of a forest block or connecting habitat by a recreational trail or by improvements constructed for farming, logging, or forestry purposes below the elevation of 2,500 feet. Habitat means the physical and biological environments in which the particular species of plant or wildlife lives. And as used in subdivisions 45, 46, and 47 of this section, recreational trail means a corridor that is not paved and that is used for recreational purposes, including hiking, walking, bicycling, cross-country skiing, snowmobiling, all-terrain vehicle riding, and horseback riding. So then those definitions are going to be used in the next section, section 20, which is amending criterion eight of Act 250. It's adding the header of ecosystem protection, scenic beauty, and historic sites. And then the new language is on page 38. Line 13, forest blocks. So this is a new um, criterion 8B, and it's related to forest blocks. So a permit, an Act 250 permit, will not be granted for a development or subdivision within or partially within a forest block unless the applicant demonstrates that the development or subdivision will avoid fragmentation of the forest block through the design of the project or the location of project improvements or both. It is not feasible, it, it is not feasible to avoid fragmentation of the forest block and the design of the development or subdivision minimizes fragmentation of the forest block or It is not feasible to avoid or minimize fragmentation of the forest block, and the applicant will mitigate the fragmentation in accordance with section 6094 of this title. And we will get to that section next. But so what this is setting up is a avoid, minimize, mitigate standard. Um, and so what that means is when someone it wants to construct a project that is within or partially within a forest block, they have to demonstrate either that they will avoid fragmenting that forest block, or if they are unable to avoid fragmenting it, that they're minimizing fragmentation be through site design, or if they're unable to do a full avoidance or unable to minimize the fragmentation, they can then mitigate it um, in accordance with section 6094, uh, 6, which I'll get to next. But on page 39, line four, Methods for avoiding or minimizing the fragmentation of a forest block may include locating buildings and other improvements and operating the project in a manner that avoids or minimizes incursion into and disturbance of the forest block, including clustering of buildings and associated improvements. Designing roads, driveways, and utilities that serve the development or subdivision to avoid or minimize fragmentation of the forest block. Such design may be accomplished by following or sharing existing features on the land, such as roads, tree lines, stone walls, and fence lines. Representative Smith. Yeah, I have a question. Thank you. What's a forest block? A thousand acres or a hundred acres? Or... So the definition of a forest block is actually on page 36. And it doesn't set a size requirement, 
It's any contiguous area of forest in any stage of succession not currently developed for non-forest use. Oh, it can be any size piece of property? Yes. That doesn't give a landowner much opportunity to defend his property, does it? Against situations like this, if they want to mandate what can be a forest block and what cannot be a forest block. So um, the next, one of the next sections that's coming up is actually directing the, um, the Agency of Natural Resources to map the forest blocks. And so I think, and establish uh, a procedure for how they will decide what is a forest block. So um, this it, there is contemplation later here about provide, providing maps of where forest blocks are so that people will be on notice of what is considered a forest. But there's nothing written in it right now as to what a forest block exactly is. Um, well, what it is, but not necessarily it's this, whether or not there's a size threshold for them. <clears throat> and so also currently town maps are supposed to um, already map forest blocks on their town maps. So some of those maps should already exist and because they've been required since at least 2016, I believe. So would, would each parcel or each property owned by an individual be a forest block? If someone owns 50 acres, is that considered a forest block? Or if someone owns 10 acres, is that considered a forest block? Or all of the above? Um, I don't know if any of the existing rules around that set a size threshold. I don't know off the top of my head. Should it be specified? I'm going to just ask that we, can we just let this, let's process what's here and then we'll get into that kind okay. of level of detail. Yeah. Yes, Thank we you. will. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. And I also, I haven't looked at that in a while, so I can't remember if there is a, a size threshold already required for the town maps. Um, so on page 39, a uh, very similar language is, is included in a new sub-criterion 8C regarding connecting habitat. So a permit will not be granted for a development or subdivision unless the applicant demonstrates that the development or subdivision will avoid fragmentation of a habitat connector through the design of the project or the location of project improvements or both. On to page 40. It is not feasible to avoid fragmentation of the habitat connector and the design of the development or subdivision minimizes fragmentation of the connector, or it is not a, it is not feasible to avoid or minimize fragmentation of the habitat connector and the hab and the applicant will mitigate the fragmentation in accordance with section 6094 of this title. Methods for avoiding or minimizing the fragmentation of a habitat connector may include locating buildings and other improvements at the farthest feasible location from the center of the connector, designing the location of buildings and other improvements to leave the greatest contiguous portion of the area undisturbed in order to facilitate wildlife travel through the, through the connector, or when there is no feasible site for construction of buildings or other improvements outside the connector, designing the buildings and improvements to facilitate the continued viability of the connector for use by wildlife. Section 21 is uh, Criterion 8, B, and C rulemaking. So on or before January, uh, June 15th, 2025, the Natural Resources Board shall file a final proposed rule with the Secretary of State and Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules to implement the requirements of the administration of those two new criteria that I just discussed, force blocks and connecting habitats. Um, on page 41, section 22, this is also, as I was just mentioning, language you've seen quite a few times, it always has traveled with the um, force blocks and connecting habitat language, so it is about resource mapping. So the Secretary of Natural Resources shall complete and maintain resource mapping based on GIS or other technology. The mapping shall identify natural resources throughout the state, including forest blocks and connecting habitat that may be relevant to the consideration of energy projects 
and projects subject to Chapter 151 of this title, which is Act 250. The Center for Geographic Information shall be available to provide assistance to the Secretary in carrying out the resource mapping. The Secretary shall consider the resource maps developed under subsection A of the section when providing evidence and recommendations to the PUC under section 248B5, and when commenting or providing recommendations under chapter 151 to district commissions on other projects. The Secretary shall establish and maintain written procedures that include a process and science-based criteria for updating resource maps developed under subsection A of this section. Before establishing or revising these procedures, the Secretary shall provide opportunities for affected parties and the public to submit relevant information and recommendations. So I guess I would just say one of the, one of the topics for consideration is gonna be how this um, section will relate to the future land use mapping information that we've received back from the Regional Planning Commission. So you know, stay tuned. This is placeholder language from the mapping. It's two o'clock. It's two o'clock. Um, do you want me to proceed? Let's see. Um, I mean, I guess we should keep going for another five minutes. Okay. Yeah, we'll see where we get to. Okay, so the language on page 42 starts a new section or, or set of sections related to location-based jurisdiction. And a lot of this language that you are about to see is new. Um, however, the concept was in the Act 250 Commission report. So that, so six years ago, that report did contain a lot of the concepts that are in here. So it's updating the jurisdictional triggers um, based on uh, the location slash type of resource. And this does um, also relate to the NRB's most recent report as well. So on page 20, uh, 42, section 23 is amending 6001 in Act 250, and it's amending the definition of development, which is what we think of as the jurisdictional primary jurisdictional trigger for Act 250. So it's leaving intact the 10 acre jurisdictional trigger. So for commercial or industrial purposes in a town that has adopted permanent zoning and subdivision bylaws, a project on 10 or more acres triggers Act 250. If the town does not have zoning, it's one or more acres. Um, or also if the um, municipality has elected to have one acre jurisdiction apply. And so that brings us to page 43. So none of that is new. On page 43, on line four, a new jurisdictional trigger reads, the construction of improvements on a tract or tract of land within a radius of five miles of any point on any involved land within five years, owned or controlled by a person, involving four or more units of housing, located in a rural and working lands area. So uh, the definition of rural and working lands area will come up later, but in those areas, four or more units of housing will trigger Act 250 jurisdiction if constructed within five miles within five years. Next, the construction of improvements for commercial, industrial, or residential use at or above 2,500 feet or within 25 feet of a critical resource area. So again, critical resource area is defined on an, uh, an upcoming page, but what this is saying is any construction in or within a critical resource area will trigger Act 250. So this is increasing the amount of Act 250 jurisdiction in critical resource areas. And then finally on this page, the construction of improvements for commercial, industrial, or residential use on a tract or tracts of land more than 500 feet from the center line of a state or town highway located in a rural or and working lands area. This shall not include existing residential buildings or the construction of a garage or other buildings incidental to residential use. So this is a new concept that this committee has not considered before. It is a different kind of jurisdictional trigger 
for um, any construction that is located more than 500 feet from a, a state or town highway. If located in a rural and working lands area. Well, that does get us to about five minutes past. That's a lot of talking for Ellen. <laughs> Um, and we haven't made it all the way through, but I think um, what we will do is take our break and shift gears. And I guess I need to orient the committee to you know, the larger plan here, which is that um, we're gonna walk through some bills that have been introduced introduced um, the next uh, and, and requested by other committees. So they've been kind of, I just want us to look at them see if, um, you know, review them, understand them, and see if there's issues that we have with them. And we will continue the Act 250 walkthrough with Ellen later this week. Just kind of say one quick thing yeah. about that, just to so people understand the last bit about the 500 feet mm. is an alternative to the road rule. So that's what that's was intended to be. It's a simplified road rule. So that's just so you know what it is. That's it. Yeah, and all that that I was just talking about was pretty new, so we'll have to go back and like actually present the sort of balancing concept that's part of the location-based jurisdiction. Yeah. Yeah. Flip side of that is Yeah. Stay tuned. But for now, we'll take a 10-minute break.